Hello again, advanced chemistry students. Uh, in this series of slides and in this video, we're going to go through and talk a little bit about uh, different solid lattices. Now, at the beginning of this unit, we talked a little bit about how there are two, broadly stated, two types of solids. There are crystalline solids, which we're going to spend uh, the next few minutes talking in some detail about. And then there are amorphous solids. We're not going to spend any time talking about amorphous solids, but basically the difference comes down to almost as simple as amorphous solids aren't really as pretty to look at as crystalline solids. Amorphous solids, the atoms and molecules, are not arranged in a regular pattern, whereas in crystalline solids, like some of the samples you see on this uh, first slide, have a regular arrangement of the atoms and molecules within the structure. That regular arrangement is going to be called a lattice. And what we're going to do is spend some time looking at specific types of crystalline lattices. All right. From a larger perspective, there are uh, a total of, as you can see on this slide, 14 different kinds of lattice structures. Now, a lattice structure is the entire arrangement of atom upon atom or upon molecule upon molecule. All of the Avogadro's number of molecules and atoms arranged in three-dimensional space. What you can then identify within that lattice is a smaller, regular repeating unit that actually stamps out over and over into the entire lattice. That smaller repeating unit is called the unit cell. And so we have 14 different unit cells. Mother Nature, in her infinite wisdom, has come up with 14 patterns that she uses to stamp out all different types of crystalline solids. Now, we have 14 of them, and then there are some subcategories of these 14, so you actually get to 32 different crystalline systems. Um, and that's too much detail for us. We're not really going to get into that. Because what I want to really focus in on, what we're ultimately going to focus in on, are the top three here, the cubic unit cells. They come in three flavors. There's the simple cubic unit cell, the body-centered cubic unit cell, and the face-centered cubic unit cell. Now, they're cubic unit cells for, I think, fairly obvious reasons. They look like cubes. Um, what differs between these different unit cells is how the atoms or molecules within that unit cell are ultimately arranged. The cool thing about unit cells, the cool things about lattices, is the way the atoms and molecules are arranged at the atomic scale the way they're arranged within these different unit cells actually translates into the way the materials look in the macroscopic world uh, at the scale that you and I could hold in our hand. What would be known as the, I believe that is one of the, here we go, uh, I believe it's one of the tetragonal systems here. It's the simple tetragonal system. So here's a couple of examples. Calcium carbonate, CaCO3, that actually fits at the molecular atomic level, has kind of a slanted look to its unit cell. And as you can see here in the macroscopic sample, it has sort of a slanted structure to its unit cell. So, not surprisingly, the way the molecules and atoms are arranged at the molecular level translates into the way they're going to look at the macroscopic level. Here's sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is one of the cubic unit cell structures. NaCl has a cubic unit cell structure, and you can clearly see that in the cubes of sodium chloride. They're all tiny little cubes. So while we're going to describe the details at the uh, small level, these details translate into the macroscopic level. Let's take a look at uh, some of the details of a particular subset of unit cells. What I have here, as you can quite clean, plainly see, are all the cubic unit cells. You're not going to be held responsible for any of the details of the other 11 unit cell types you saw a couple of slides ago. We're going to focus in on the details here of these three cubic unit cells. Now, we're showing two representations on this slide. One is sort of a ball and stick model that are shown here uh, up at the top of the picture here. We have these various ball and stick models 
we have the uh, simple cubic ball and stick, the body-centered cubic, and then the face-centered cubic. And then down below here, we have what are called space-filling models. All right, so um, the, the molecules and atoms are not held together by these little lines, right? They're actually sort of in contact with one another. So these sorts of space-filling models are a little bit more of an honest representation of how these uh, systems are actually organized. Okay, so first I'm going to ask uh, what seems like a fairly straightforward question. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that all of these corners, okay, that little red ball there, we're going to assume that that is an atom. And for simplicity's sake, let's think that we're looking at a, a specific material. Let's say we're looking at elemental sodium. Maybe elemental sodium crystallizes in these different cubic unit cells. Now that's not strictly true, but just for simplicity's sake, let's say that these are sodium uh, models. So that little atom that I just circled, that represents one sodium atom. And so let me ask a simple question. How many sodium atoms, how many of these little red circles are in a simple cubic unit cell? Seems like a pretty straightforward question. How many atoms are in a simple cubic unit cell? Think for three seconds, come up with your answer. While you're doing that, I'm going to do a little bit of erasing just to clean up a little bit of space here. <clears throat> All right, so how many atoms are there in a simple cubic unit cell? Well, if you answered eight, then you have exactly the correct wrong answer. It turns out that there's actually only one atom in a simple cubic unit cell. One, where am I getting one from? I get one because of these different corner atoms, not all of the atom is inside the cube of the unit cell. What you can see a little bit better in the space filling model, if I draw the front face of a cube onto the space filling model, you'll see that only a portion of each atom is actually inside the unit cell. So what we have here is we have eight different atoms that are part of that cube, but each uh, atom only contributes one eighth of itself to the unit cell, so we have one atom in the cell, one atom per cell. Okay. Let's try this analysis with the body-centered cubic. In body-centered cubic, we have the eight atoms on the corners. We also have an atom in the dead middle of the cube. And again, we're going to simplify, and even though they're represented with different colors here, let's assume that they're all the same types of atoms. So the same question. How many atoms are in a body-centered cubic unit cell? Hopefully you're catching the trick now, and hopefully you've answered two. Where do we get two from? Well, we still have our eight corner atoms, each contributing one-eighth of themselves, but then we have to add to that the one atom that's in the uh, center of the cell that contributes its entire self to that cell, and so we get two atoms per cell for a body-centered cubic. All right, so you know where this is going. How about face-centered cubic? How many atoms of a face-centered structure are inside the unit cell? I'll leave you to do the math, but the answer is going to be four atoms per cell. See if you can figure out uh, how I get to four um, in, in your own time, um, but it's a very similar calculation. You just have to think about how face atoms, these blue atoms, how they're arranged um, within the unit cell. All right, the other thing I want to point out here with some of these structures and I uh, to do this is uh, how these atoms are packed. In simple cubic, you can see that along one of the edges of the cube, along any of the edges of the cube, the atoms are actually in physical contact. There's no gap between the atoms along the edge of a simple cube. So now you can begin to think about maybe doing some Pythagorean theorem on these structures. If I have an edge length, we'll call it E, along each of the sides of the cube, well, I could figure out 
maybe how long that hypotenuse uh, area, how long that length is. What else could I do? I could figure out the volume of a simple cube. The volume is going to be simply the edge of the cube cubed. Things get a little bit trickier when I look at some of the other arrangements. I'm going to move over to the far right and look at face centered cubic first. And face centered cubic, along the edge of the cube, the atoms don't touch. There's a gap between the white spheres here. There's some space. So that edge length, which we could still call E, of course, isn't going to be fully representative of a contact distance there. But there is some direct contact. That direct contact actually comes along the <clears throat> hypotenuse of the face of the cube. Now this gets a little bit trickier. Let's think about this in terms of the radii of the atoms. Assuming white and red is the same, let's look at the radius. How long is this hypotenuse with respect to the radius of the atom? That length here, I'll call it L, that length is going to be equal to 4 radii. 1 radii from the corner white, 2 radii from the red, and another radii from the other corner white. So that distance there, that length, that hypotenuse length, is actually 4R. Then we could do some deconvolution to go ahead and get our edge length, and then from that edge length we could once again go ahead and get the volume. Again, I'll leave that calculation for you to do, but hopefully you can see how you could get from the atomic radius to the length to the edge to the volume. All right, lastly, body-centered cubic. Again, we see along the edge that the atoms don't actually touch. Again, there's a little bit of a gap here. A smaller gap than what we saw for face-centered, but there's a gap nonetheless. But there is a contact. There is direct contact. This is harder to see. This direct contact actually goes through the body diagonal of the body-centered cube. So I'll show it on the, on the ball and stick model. So this atom up here in the top left touches the body-centered atom, which touches the back bottom right atom. So there's contact through three-dimensional space through the body-centered cube, okay? So then if I wanted to call that uh, some distance L, I could do a little bit of work and figure out how that L is connected to that edge and connected to that face diagonal. That's a little bit of a trickier geometry problem. But with some basic uh, Pythagorean work, you should be able to also work out how big the volume of a body-centered cubic unit cell is. And we're going to address these in more detail um, in class together. But I wanted to make sure you got to the introductions here of unit cells. There are 14 types of unit cells, three of which are cubic unit cells, those three being simple, body-centered, and face-centered cubic unit cells. Each of these unit cells have different numbers of atoms in them, one, two, and four for the different types of cubic unit cells. And then we can begin to think about doing other geometric-based calculations on these unit cells once we know um, edge lengths and information like that. What we're going to see in class is some stoichiometric calculations that we can do with cubic unit cells. Uh, we'll get through those calculations uh, hopefully on Monday and Tuesday of next week, which will set you up very well to uh, be able to finish the first slam, which is uh, due on Friday the 28th. All right, that'll do it for now. We'll continue with unit cells in class uh, next week.